is up, guys, and welcome to another episode of What Any Vision. Welcome to the first ever podcast dedicated to Paraguayan football in English. As always, I'm Roberto Rojas, and joining me as always are my great co-hosts, Federico Perez, Maria Ritos, and Ralph Hanna. And guys, it's finally here. It's the Super Classico. We begin the month of May with the biggest game in Paraguay in probably the most important time in the league at the moment with only a couple of games left. And this game is probably just as important for both sides and as well as the other teams that are looking onto this match as a way of seeing if they have any chances of winning the league. So we'll go straight into it. We'll go straight to the motherland to Fede. Fede, how are you, man? How's things over there in Paraguay heating up with the Super Classico starting in about less than 24 hours? Yeah, it's finally here, right, Roberto? A, a very important match for everyone here in Paraguay. Obviously, the two biggest teams, uh, popular-wise. And the last five games of the Apertura tournament also, we're right at that uh, ending corner. And I think this match could be just as crucial for Olympia, but I think more for Cerro Porteño uh, due to their situation in the table. And, you know, uh, they really do need to look for this win. Uh, after a week where these two teams were making some noise in Libertadores, Olivia getting their win finally, and Cerro Porteño uh, struggling here at home. I think they, they, had, they did better probably playing away, but we'll talk about the matches. I know Maria's take on Olivia is going to be interesting. I know Ralph's take on Cerro Porteño is also going to be very interesting today. And looking forward, obviously, this is the preview of the Super Classico, so we're going to probably give our predictions and talk a little bit about what the teams are expecting. Uh, their starting teams, maybe we can talk about that, but, you know, there's only a couple of days in between these Libertadores matches and the game that's going to be played in the Cerro Porteño Stadium, the biggest match uh, of the tournament up until now. I don't know if it's going to be a, a so, so determinating, but it's probably going to be a very exciting game. It's probably going to have a lot of impact also on the tournament leave it looking at it especially because they play on monday so they will, will they see they will we'll see if they have more pressure on them on their game on monday or if they are going to play more relaxed and maybe garnetto can even play some substitutes on that game depending on what happens because if they tie between olympia and cerro porteño you know uh libertad can speculate a little bit more with that result Definitely. It'll be very interesting to see what happens for these teams. I think certainly everyone, as I said, is going to be expecting on this game. And just like uh, our co-host here, we'll go to Maria here, who has been dealing with a bunch of sweating nowadays because of the uh, the COVID side effects. But let's see if you're a bit more calm this weekend with this big Super Classico. How are you, Maria? <laughs> hey, guys. Uh, happy to be back. Uh, I'm sorry I had to miss last episode but i'm back and it's a gonna be a great episode this time because we got the super classical this weekend which is always a great a great time in paraguay i wish i could be in paraguay to to celebrate and to watch this great time especially now at this ending of the the, the apertura when it gets more intense more uh where there's la liga like they say in 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 spain um but Talking about, um, obviously, uh, a, a little bit of what happened uh, to me, I, I just had a few, a few body aches and, you know, I, I had to rest a little bit. Unfortunately, uh, I had to miss this last episode, but other than that, I'm super happy that I took it. And uh, nonetheless, I'm very excited to talk about uh, the Super Classico. Uh, like Fede said, we'll talk. I'll talk a little more about what happened with Olympia and the Libertadores, how they're looking to 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 go this Saturday against Cerro. And uh, yeah, uh, let's see what you guys have uh, so far to talk about as well. Absolutely. And we'll go to Ralph on this one, who I hope can get a bit more joy after what we saw from Arsenal in the Europa League yesterday. Obviously, we also have to give our congratulations to Sportivo Luqueño, who are celebrating their 100th anniversary as a club. But how are you, man? And how are you feeling about the Super Classico in about 24 hours time? Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Welcome back, Maria. Um, yeah, good. I mean, uh, it's going to be an exciting game. These games are coming thick and fast. Both both sides played midweek the same night on, on Wednesday night, and now they're back. 
on Saturday evening in a very late Clásico. It's traditionally the Clásico they play during the day or, or the afternoon at least because of the fans and security and that kind of thing. So we have an 8 p.m. kickoff local time and on Saturday, which is which is quite rare for the Clásico. But it's also to give the players a bit more recovery time because like Fede is saying, you know, they just came off the back of these, these Libertadores games. Um, so, you know, looking forward to it. It's, I think it's... It, it's one of those games, it's apart from everything that goes in the league. Like, even if the league title race wasn't close, this is still a huge game. You know, often if a, if a team's having a bad season, then it's just, well, at least win the Clásico, you know? And now it's, like, added to that. It's, it's, like, it's always like a cup final kind of feeling that, you know, this game is all form goes out the window, everything becomes very tight. I mean... You know, players aren't going to worry about if they have four yellow cards and they're about to get suspended for the next game. Like, this is all in. So it's always a, a great occasion. Uh, even if the teams kind of cancel each other out, maybe in the score, and you get a nil-nil draw, the games are usually filled with some kind of emotion, you know, either way with refereeing decisions, with with close chances, with player rivalries. So I'm, I'm looking forward to get into it. Yeah, it will definitely be a very interesting game. And I think we'll go straight into it and talk about what happened. And Rob, I'll keep to you on this one because obviously we saw Setup with Daniel compete midweek in probably one of the more dullest games that we saw in the Lear Thardis, a nil-nil draw. Coming back from winning against America de Cali over there in Colombia, they go back home to La Nueva Olla and end up with a nil-nil draw against Deportivo La Guaira. And so I, I think now, as we've seen Cerro perform in the last week, obviously get their win against America de Cali. They also beat one on the weekend in Paraguay. And now they get this result. How, how do you see Cerro Porteño going into this game, which now I think they're more under, more obligated to, to get the result that they need and, of course, get the revenge of what happened in the last Super Classico? Yeah, there's there's definitely a feeling I think of of the revenge of of the last Super Clásico. There's the fact they're actually three points behind Olympia, so they need to make up ground in the league. Um, and then there's this question of they're at home and they're playing at home, which is very rare, by the way. This is only the fifth Clásico that's ever been no the sixth. This is going to be Clásico that's been played in La Hoya. Um, you know, usually the games are played in Defensores del Chaco. So there's a lot of pressure on them to take the game and, and you know, and get the victory, which is exactly what happened on Wednesday night. You know, they were the home team. They're the favorite, of course, to be La Guaira, and they were expected to take the game to them. They did in a way, but it was an ineffective way. Um, they, they controlled possession. I think La Guaira had some opportunities on the break where maybe with a better pass they could have generated something but they didn't they didn't generate like any kind of danger for Cerro and talking about Cerro and the, and the big Guareña and they beat America de Cali they're keeping the clean sheets they're looking very compact they're looking good defensively uh, for sure um, in fact I think they've gone now I think it's four clean sheets in a row since the 3-3 draw with ah no they lost 3-0 to, to Libertad but well three clean sheets in a row, they're looking more compact. The issue was was attack and how to break down a team like La Guaira that was very well organized, um, and they found it very difficult. They were trying to use a lot of, of kind of wide play, using Arsamendia on the left, sometimes Beto Espinola, but it was mostly Arsamendia on the left-hand side, and then if Pachi Carrizo was going over there, or Aquino was sometimes playing over there on the left, and then they're trying to cross balls in. Which made sense because you have Boselli in the middle. So they were thinking, okay, we have like a classic target man. Let's try and pull into the box, get some joy from there. Um, but overall, Cerro had 67 crosses in that game, which is a huge amount. Like, I'll give you some quick comparisons. Arsenal in the Europa League had 14. Uh, Barcelona in their game that they lost to Granada, they had like 15. In the Champions League game, Man City and PSG, I think they both had like 15 each. So 67 crosses in a game is like, it's a huge amount. Um, and it clearly didn't work. I mean, you know, they the kind of effectiveness of those crosses is they connected like two or three. Uh, some players, you know, I think Asamendia one cross out of 22. I mean, they really struggled um, trying to find that way of breaking down uh, La Guaira. So the questions there is for Chiquiasa is, are you going to go with the same tactic? And then if it doesn't work, you know, what's your plan B? What's your option? And 
And is it, you know, somebody like Fernando Ovelar who came on and actually started to look quite interesting, had some sparks, he could beat some players, run at people. Um, is it risking Morales from the start? Because Morales didn't play from the start because he was injured or, you know, they felt he wasn't match fit. So, you know, there's a few question marks there. But from that game, what we saw is when Cerro have to take the game to their opponent and the opponent decides to sit in with two Banks of four, they find it very hard to break them down. Um, so I'm sure Orteman, is, if he's watched the video of that game, is thinking also about him and how he would set his defense up. Yeah, definitely. I think it'll be a very interesting matchup uh, between two teams that I think will have to do better than what they saw midweek. Okay, we did see Olympia win um, against Always Ready, but they had to chase the result and come back from it, not as opposed to Cedro, who were just trying so hard to break down a really organized like white side that you said, Ralph. And Maria, I want to go to you on this one because I think for Olympia's case, they're in a obligation where, of course, they want to do well in both competitions and getting their win against Always Ready, which was obviously the perfect response after their loss to um, to Tachira. And, you know, I, I think a Super Clasico is always special for, for any team. It doesn't matter how good or how bad the season is. Um, they want to go out and win. And so I think for this Olympia side, you would think that they have maybe a slight advantage on this one. Don't you think you feel more? So I'll ask you, do you feel as if though there is that kind of style and idea that Ortomán is trying to bring that could indeed be effective for the game against Cerro? Well, I, I, in terms of style, I think it's little by little like working for Ortomán. Um, you, it's a, it's a style that I'm not a fan of. They're kind of, they, they, the last game that they had with Always Ready was kind of boring. They didn't bring too much um, into the to the pitch. The first half was just um, nil nil, um, and then you know comes second half and Always Ready scores and kind of surprises Olympia, and uh, you know they they took. They took. A, they didn't take long for Olympia to score back, but it, it took for uh, always ready to score for them to wake up and be like, "Hey, uh, you know, we gotta do something." And uh, fortunately, you know, we had uh, Roque scoring, and then um, the 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 guy that always saves Olympia, Richard Ortiz, uh, scores at the end of, of, of the match, and then you know, it, it it's that kind of. Um, that kind of uncertainty from Olympia that doesn't really catch my attention um, and it kind of worries me. So um, I'm not going to say my predictions as of right now uh, until later, but it's not very, um, very positive for, for, for them going into this, into this game with Cerro. Um, I would, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's going to be a very tight game um tomorrow saturday so i i i think expectations wise I, it's um, i wouldn't expect too much uh as a, an olympia fan but um other than that yeah I, I like i said i'm gonna give my predictions later on but olympia are looking very uh blah in my opinion and i just don't see the excitement for ortema he's getting some results um but you know, in some cases, you want to see excitement. You want to see something fun. Uh, you want Olympia to win with confidence. And that's not what they're doing right now. And certainly they have to do that in probably their biggest game of the season, Fed. And I'll go to you on this one, because I think what we saw between both these sides is that there is an Olympia side that can be exposed defensively. And I think for Cedro's case, you know, you get that kind of attacking play from the likes of Lucena, from the likes of... Um, you know, Robert Morales and many other players that could be effective. Whereas you look at a Cedro side that, as you mentioned, Ralph, are getting cliche cheats, you know? And so you look at that kind of balance and it, it kind of does feel equal in a way. It's not in comparison to what we saw in the last game where Olympia just went out and dominated. I think after what we saw last time, and obviously looking at the results that we saw during midweek, that these two teams are going to play much more tighter. Do you feel that way? Or do you feel that maybe both of them looking at the players that they have, you know, who is going to step up and really provide an impact to this team and, and get the results uh, straight up? Yeah. You know, I think the, these two teams are going to leave, leave it out there. I think they're going to, 
they're gonna leave all their energy in the in the pitch. I think they're really gonna run in this game because it is a final for both of these games for the, both of these uh, teams because Libertad is gonna play on Monday, so they they can't think too much about the result of, of the way they they're gonna play this game. It's the same thing that happened to Olympia in midweek. They needed to win. It, it was not about how they played. It was not about finding the style yet. Maybe it, it was just about winning at home. And it's the same situation now, I, I think, for Cerro Porteño, mainly, like I said in the introduction, and Cerro is going to have to look uh, into not only having more, more the ball, more possession than, than Olivia, but, but creating chances also uh, right at the first half, you know, and it, it's going to be a very strategic game also because uh, because I, we don't know in the preview which players the, the, the coaches are really going to pick. We, we have really tired players that have played in these last two weeks, uh, uh, with with very long trips also one of them went to venezuela the other one went to colombia and and now they played again in, in midweek so uh it's really hard to see what what defense we're going to see from o olympia they've been changing that that part of the team way too much uh it's hard to know who's going to be in midfield because apparently richard ortiz is gonna is gonna get some rest time and it could be a big chance for some players that haven't seen the, the big stage lately. Uh, I was actually remembering that Aldo Maiz in one of the last uh, Super Classicos had his opportunity. And after that, probably never played again because he had a really bad game. So this match uh, is, 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 is important in, in that sense also. You know, sometimes it can, uh, it can bring up a player and it can bury him too. Uh, hopefully that's not the op hopefully that won't happen to none of the teams this weekend and hopefully they will find some solutions they, there's a couple of players that are coming back i would i've talked about Demis gonzalez lately also in olympia he's coming back from an injury he was already in in the bench for the libertadores match and he could probably get some game time uh, in this super classico just because i see him fresh and you know he this is a, a kind of game that you want to see him in just to just know exactly where he is at this stage this year, what he what he could bring to the team. Also, uh, Olympia is going to need him maybe in the next Libertadores matches too. So, so Olympia is going to mix it up around. I think a little bit. Is going to play with that strategy, knowing that that Cerro Porteño is going to come looking for for the result right away. I, I think Olympia might even play with a lot of defensive players. And, and play it back, play it relaxed, because uh, they don't want to play it at the pace that Cerro Porteño can play the game. Cerro plays a lot faster, Cerro can dominate with the ball, and, and that could be very important. That could be one of the keys in this Super Classico. That's how I'm imagining it. But uh, I don't see you guys too confident. I, I'm not hearing Ralph too confident about Cerro Porteño, even though he looks like he's more on that side of, of the Cerro Porteño jersey than on the Olympia. And uh, I'm not hearing Maria too confident either with her Olympia and, and Orteman. And that's just not, not right now. That's from day one, uh, I believe. So uh, these two teams have a lot of convincing to do after their matches in, in Libertadores mainly. They are fighting the, the Apertura and you have Libertad and Nacional just waiting to see what happens in the Super Clásico. Absolutely. I think there's going to be a lot that is going to be riding on this game. As I said, so much is going to be dependent on. And Ralph, I mean, I'll go to you on this one because I think with the Super Classico, it's always tight. You know, you always love to get those kind of cool stats. So what do you got for us in terms of this Super Classico that we're going to see on Saturday? Wow. Well, there's, there's a lot of points in Cerro's favor. Um, I mean, they, they've won one more Classico than Olympia in, the, in what is the league when they've met together in the league, I think they have 108 wins to, to Olympia's 107. So just there, as I was mentioning before, it's only the sixth game in, in La Hoya. It's, it's very rare that they play there. Um, they've actually played more in, in Parauno in, in Olympia Stadium. They played like 25 times, but in La Hoya only five times and Olympia only won once. And that was back in 1981. So if Ottoman could get a win, it would be kind of historic for, for Olympia there. And then if you look at the recent Classicos, I mean, sure, Olympia won in the first round of the Apertura 2-0 when Borosito was still the, the coach. And, and I think Fede mentioned the, the mistake from Maiz, who, was, uh, who had a tough game that, that day. But, but Cerro were missing, of course, the, the lucena Santi combination, which be, has been so important. But you go back the four games before that, and, you know, Cerro didn't lose. There's one they drew, of course, in the in the clausura, but they weren't, uh, but they weren't losing, you know, they, 
they've managed to, to usually find some kind of results, especially with say, his kind of record um, since he's come back as, as coach of Cerro. Uh, Orteman as well, if we want to talk about him, obviously it's his first classical as a, as a coach, um, but when he played against Cerro, either as coach of, of San Lorenzo or of Sol de America, he has like a, it's like a mixed record. It's totally balanced. He's played six and he's won two, drawn two, lost two. So <laughs> it's, it's very balanced. Um, so yeah, there's, I mean, there's a few statistics for you. And, and I think maybe the interesting one is that recently we have seen a lot of these 2-0, 1-0, uh, 0-0, as in that both teams haven't scored. But you would think that this time maybe it's going to be the other way around, that both teams would score because you're looking at Olympia recently and they haven't defended well. So it, it wouldn't be a surprise to see them concede. But kind of to Maria's point, they always have a player that seems to save them and get them out of trouble and find a goal from nowhere. I mean, you know, Ortiz did it last weekend with that long shot. Uh, then he did it midweek with this kind of, uh, you know, follow up after the goal mouth scramble. Even Roque's goal, actually, Roque is like he's following up the rebound from Recalde. So they're finding these ways to, to get goals somehow, uh, which will be very important in a classical because, again, like we're saying, it's a one off. It's like a final. Nobody is thinking about going to Brazil midweek because they both got games against Brazilian sides. Nobody cares about that. They just care about the, the classical and everything that happens there. And you'll see um, for sure, you know, both teams really really going for it and trying to find a goal any way they can. And that could help with Ottoman side. They don't seem to play very well, but have that habit or that knack of, of finding a solution, you know, when there doesn't seem to be one. Definitely. I think it'll be something that they have in mind of taking it all one game at a time, because, you know, as you said, Ralph, they, have, they do have to go to Brazil, but all the attention's on the Super Classico. And I think, you know, it will be tight. I, I do see goals and I think we're going to go. It's a perfect segue to end our good conversation because I think obviously there's a ton of things that will be in favor in this one, but let's go for our predictions. I will go first. I personally will see a game that I think both sides will definitely go out from the front, from the get-go. I think I will agree with Fede on this one. I think they are so though two sides that have significant weaknesses. I think when you look at how Olympia is set up, they can be exposed defensively. The question will be is how that attack that Cerro Porteño will be like, you know, playing with one striker or, or, you know, having to rely on crosses from the flanks. It'll be interesting, but I, I think all said and done, I think we're going to go into a more balanced game personally, and I'll keep with Ralph's uh, history of um, Orteman's case as a manager. I will see this go out in a draw, which I think favors more to the sides of Libertad Nacional, who will look at that result with much more positive um, eyes than, than Cerro and Olympia. So I will go for a 2-2 draw on this one between both Cerro and Olympia. Let's go to Maria on this one. What do you see this game? Well, yes, I completely agree with you, Roberto. I, like I said earlier, um, I was saying that Olympia was a side that is not very um, convincing yet for me. So um, I think they're going to go into this game uh, thinking that they want to win, obviously, but they're already in the second place in the, in the, they're, they're in the table in second place. Uh, Cerro is in fourth place. So it, I think that they're going to go in and then they're going to say, look, if we draw, we draw, and that's fine. So, um, you know, they're still going to get a point out of this and they're still going to be ahead. Um, so in my opinion, I think the um, Olympia is just looking for um, maybe a draw and uh, Cerro obviously would want to win this because that way they can actually catch up and, and, and be up there with, with, with the top of the table. And um, so Essentially, I think that um, this game can end in a draw. I'm going to go with a 1-1 uh, uh, because we haven't seen many goals from, from either side. Uh, maybe a, a little bit of uh, Cerro. We've seen some nice goals and uh, uh, Richard Ortiz's great goal, but unfortunately, he's not going to be there. So that's another one. Um, ha not having Richard Ortiz tells me that Olympia is just thinking about the Libertadores uh, rather than than winning this uh, this apertura, 
But other than that, yeah, I, I go for a 1-1 draw. Fede, I see your reaction that you've gotten to me and to Maria. What have you been thinking, man? I can't believe you guys are always going for these draws. Come on, you got to play for somebody. I mean, this is a final. I think uh, one of these two teams are going to win it. I do believe, like Rob said, these last Super Classic have all been really tight, and I do think we will have a tight game again. They've been playing against each other so many times. Uh, these players really know each other very well. And um, uh, I think Olympia is going to win it. Uh, I, I, I said it a couple of episodes ago. I think Cerro Porteño lost their opportunity to get back into this a, a couple of games ago. And, you know, just they, they got another chance after beating Guairenia and what happened with Libertad against Nacional. But I just I see them way too tired after having so much ball and not doing absolutely anything with it. So they're not being too creative lately. I'm not seeing the best out of Claudio Aquino yet uh, in Libertadores. I'm waiting for that big player that, that, that was probably their best player last year. So I'm not seeing Cerro Porteño ending the, the tournament like I wanted them to, to end it. They were my candidate, but they just haven't really evolved as a, as a team. And uh, even though individual, their players right now are looking a little bit better, especially that midfield of Pica Lucena and, and Villa Santi. The, their their backs are also I think a, a lot stronger right now but uh, I think Olympia they, even if they mix it up they're getting players back and I, I think they're going to have better subs in the second half of the of the game and Orteman is going to have some backup players there to finish up the job and Olympia is going to win it and remember that I was the only one that said it well, let's see if Ralph has any disagreements or will agree with one of us because, you know, he has a few choices to pick. So, Ralph, how do you see this new Super Classico ending up? So, I can't see Fede's, uh, Fede's prediction of Olympia winning for the only the second time in La Hoya against Cerro, uh, that which, like I was saying, would be very historic. I'm actually leaning to, to Cerro in this one. Um I would say Cerro's problem is playing teams like La Guaira that, that defend very well and they can't break them down. Or occasionally teams like a Nacional or Guairenia that can really press you very high. Olympia do neither of those things. So I don't think we'll see Cerro with those problems of breaking down the defense. I also think if you're looking at if Morales does start and his movement against players like Alcaraz and Polenta that aren't great in terms of movement and athleticism, then they certainly have a chance of scoring. Um, that said, I also think Olympia have the capability to score. You have Brian Ojeda coming back. You have Ramon Sosa playing really well at the moment. He's, he's growing into each game. Roque is, is always Roque. You don't know what he will do. He came on, almost changed the game against always ready with some of the just hold up play that he was doing and dragging the super sub that position. Roberto wanted, right? The super sub that Roberto wanted. There you go. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. Um, so I'm going to say Cerro, but both teams will score. So I'm going to say Cerro win 2-1. Well, the good thing is that one of us is going to be right on this one. Um, so let's see what happens. I, but again, I think it will be a very interesting game. I, yeah, Fede, hey, you know, just for that, I hope that, and of course, I obviously want Cerro to win. Um, but that being said, I, I think uh, it'll be a very interesting game. I think certainly there's two teams that are fighting for that same objective to win the league title and to really pressure it until the end. We've already seen how tight a race it's been so far, and we can only hope that it will continue like that all the way until the end of the season. So again, it'll be a very exciting game, and I can't wait to see what happens uh, in this one. So again, guys, another great episode, another great preview of the Super Classico, the biggest game in Paraguay. And so I get that's a perfect way to end the show. So for myself, Roberto Rojas, for Fede Perez, Maria Ritos, and for Ralph Hanna, thank you so much for listening to another episode of One on Vision. See you soon.